It's the Security Weekly News, episode 292. I'm Doug White, and this is the week of 23 April 2023. We've got two Teenage Mutant Ninja Hackers, Mark Twain, TP Leak, Intel, Paper Cut, Rust Bucket, Solar Winds, Blue Check Marks, Jason Wood, and more on this edition of the Security Weekly News. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Did you know that Active Directory is exploited in 9 out of 10 cyber attacks? With access to Active Directory, attackers can gain control of your network. To keep attackers out, you need to find and fix Active Directory security gaps. Meet Purple Knight, a free security assessment tool that scans your environment for hundreds of vulnerabilities and helps you fix the problems. Ready to reduce your Active Directory attack surface? Download Purple Knight, the number one Active Directory security vulnerability assessment tool. Visit securityweekly.com slash Semperis, S-E-M-P-E-R-I-S, for more information. Created in 2005 and hosted by security industry veterans, Paul Security Weekly is your source for in-depth coverage of the latest vulnerabilities, exploits, and security research. Our weekly security news discussion dives deep into the security issues we face today and potential solutions in a fun and lively atmosphere. Each week, we bring on guests from the security community to learn about their journey and discuss topics relevant to their work and research. You can also subscribe to our show by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe or look for Paul Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher. We've recorded a ton of content over the years, so we created Spotify playlists featuring some of our favorite episodes, including interviews with Marcus Random, John McAfee, and Chris Roberts, to name a few. You can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash starter packs. All right, it's the Security Weekly News here in the springtime. Uh, this week, Mirai Malware Botnet is exploiting a TP Link Archer A21 Wi Fi router. So that's like a Soho type router. Um, basically, this exploit allows the ransomware gang to compromise the device and add it to a distributed denial of service botnet. The flaw was first seen in the Pwn to Own event back in December of 2022 in Toronto. And in that event, two different teams were able to compromise the AX1800. Uh, one of them was using the WAN port and one was using the LAN interface. So basically all the port, well, all the physical ports on the device. Uh, the flaw, so after they did this, of course, the flaw was disclosed to the public in January of 2023. So last month, a firmware updated patch uh, was released uh, to, to fix the flaw. But Zero Day Initiative said that there was evidence of exploitation attempts in the wild starting last week. So, and they said all those initially focused on Eastern Europe, but it was spreading worldwide. So the vulnerability is an unauthenticated command injection flaw in the API of the, wait for it, web management interface of the Archer AX21 router. Um, Basically, like a lot of these, a lack of input sanitation means that the API, which manages the router's language settings, has no ability to validate or filter what is passed to it which means that if you build a custom, you know, a custom command, you can basically hand commands off to it to be executed, which is a lot like those old timey pipe attacks. So that, you know, some of the early hacks on Linux systems and things were just literally, you know, piping things into commands you had access to and getting them to execute with system level privilege. And that that's kind of how those attacks continue to work. ZDI said that a new version of Mirai botnet exploits the vulnerability to gain access to the device and then downloads a binary that recruits the device into the botnet. Uh, So the new zombie army is apparently focused on launching distributed denial of service attacks that so far have focused mostly on game servers and they have the ability to launch attacks against Valve Source Engine, which is of course the part behind Steam, uh, a major gaming platform. Uh, an initial patch of this problem came out back in February, but apparently it was incomplete and did not stop the exploit. So if you have a TP-Link Archer AX21, you might want to patch it, or at the very least, you may want to protect the management interfaces because uh, apparently, you know, well, patch it, or I'll turn this car around. Yeah, that kind of thing. Anyway, 
Multiple generations of Intel CPUs are apparently vulnerable to a new attack which can allow data to be leaked through the EF flags register. So EF flags is a, is a register in CPUs that basically provides a bunch of uh, binary information about what uh, the current status of the CPU is. So Tsinghua, uh, the University of Mar Tsinghua University, the University of Maryland, and a computer lab at uh, the Chinese Ministry of Education found this vulnerability and said it was a side channel attack, but was different than most side channel attacks. And if, if you don't recall, these types of side channel attacks usually exploit the caching of the CPU, but this one leverages a flaw in transient execution. So the paper was published on arxiv.org, arx4, arx4, I guess, uh, described the flaw in the EF flags register as affecting the timing of the jump condition code instructions. And all this gets very, you know, esoteric at, at, you know, well, it may already be esoteric, but basically the EF flags, you know, component of the CPU is describing the state of the processor. The jump condition code is a CPU instruction set, which allows conditional branching based on what's in that EF flags register. So that, that JCC looks at the EF flags register and then makes decisions about what to do next. So in this particular attack, the attacker was triggering transient execution and encoding something. And so that becomes the secret data. And then the second step is to use the time it took in the JCC, which apparently allows you to decode the secrets somehow. I, I don't know exactly how they did all that. I think that uh, the academic paper of it actually has a full walkthrough of all that stuff. So if you're interested in it, it's a form of attack that's a lot like Meltdown, which was part of that Spectre Meltdown business back in like 2018 that affected a lot of processors. And all of this, of course, is related to what is called speculative execution. And that's where the processor essentially sets up what it thinks it's probably going to have to do next in the cache while it's waiting for the last task to be done. So it guesses what the next thing is going to be. And so somewhere in all that timing and those transients, it's possible to exploit that somehow. But basically, by using the attack in this paper, they showed a 100% success rate for being able to decode secret information on an Intel i7-6700 and 7700 uh, using Ubuntu 22.04 and kernel 5.15. Uh, there's no current evidence of an exploit of this in the wild. Uh, it sounded like it was, you know, not something that was very easy to do, but it is a really nice summary of that paper. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you might want to read the summary and then see if you think you want to read the paper. There is a link to the art, to the actual paper in the article if you want to dig into it. If you use Papercut MFNG print management, well, you should probably patch that today. Uh, two severe vulnerabilities exist in the software, which allows attackers to install a Terra remote management and then take over your server. Yeah. Papercut claims on their site that they have more than 100 million users from over 70,000 companies worldwide. And these two flaws allow a remote attacker to bypass authentication and execute arbitrary code on servers with system privileges in what they called a low complexity attack requiring no user interaction, which is like the worst kind of possible attack. Horizon 3 published a blog post yesterday which contained detailed technical information and a proof of concept exploit, which of course could be used to run the compromise. Huntress also created a proof of concept exploit to illustrate this threat. So Shodan showed that there's only about 1,700 exposed papercut servers worldwide. So not a massive number of, of at risk, although this can be an internal attack as well. But Huntress said they've been analyzing these attacks since the 16th of April and that the attackers were using the flaw to execute PowerShell commands that install Atera or Synchro, which is another remote management piece of software. These are all that stuff like log me in kind of stuff for, you know, managing your, you know, remotely servers you have. The domain they were using is called windowsserverscenter.com, which was registered on the 12th of April. And apparently this domain was also being used to host and deliver TrueBot Downloader, which is linked to the Silence Cybercrime Group. Um, and basically uh, that group was, uh, they apparently used to develop CLOP. 
So patch up your paper cuts today, or this thing may, I mean, it's obviously being targeted. So even if there's not that many of them, Blue Noroff is a hacking group linked to North Korea. Uh, they're now using a new Mac OS family of malware in recent attacks, according to JamF. Uh, the malware is called Rust Bucket, and it is able to retrieve additional payloads. So it's one of these multi-stage uh, modern you know, types of malware. It can retrieve additional payloads from the command and control server. The malware has been attributed to Blue Noroff, and, which is believed to be a subgroup of Lazarus. Uh, and of course, if you aren't familiar, Lazarus is of course affiliated with the North Korean government. Uh, the attack begins by using a stage one malware, which is an unsigned application called internal PDF viewer.app. And so this thing obviously gets delivered by either some kind of uh, social engineering or phishing sort of thing, basically retrieves a stage two payload from the server. The report says that the internal PDF viewer app will not execute unless the user manually overrides Gatekeeper on the Mac OS, which means that most likely it's a social engineering attack. So they have to call you, get you to actually run this thing and approve you know, going around Gatekeeper. Uh, so that's how they kind of got to that conclusion. The second stage then is a signed application which acts like an Apple bundle, bundle identifier. It displays a fake PDF to the, to the person who's doing it, which has a bunch of information from some kind of venture capital firm that apparently is legit. They just copied it. So then once you do that and you approve all this, it begins communication with the command and control server to get the third stage payload, which at this point is a signed Trojan written in Rust. The malware can run on ARM and uh, x86 architectures. This malware gathers system info, running processes, time, uh, detects virtual machines. It can allow the attacker to perform all sorts of actions on the machine. So basically, I guess the point here is that you may want to warn your people about these kind of attacks again, because this is, and we have another story about this later, but this is basically where they talk you through the install, right? I did, I did one a few years ago, and I did the whole thing on a virtual machine that I set up while I was talking to the guy and acting like I was, 100, I was, I, I was a 100-year-old artist who didn't use the computer much. And the guy got really agitated with my abil inability to find the software he wanted me to install so he could, quote, remove the hackers from my computer for me. I kept, I kept him on while I spun up a Windows 7 VM so we could remove the hackers. And he finally hung up about 20 minutes in. And, and you know, when I said, oh, no, I think I turned the whole machine off again. Well, let's reboot the old girl. It shouldn't take but a couple of minutes. So what's the weather like there today? And, and the guy got really mad and started swearing at me and hung up. So I guess he presumed I was either an idiot or I was really old or I was just messing with him. So anyway. And as long as we're talking about North Korea, the group behind the 3CX supply chain attack were also apparently breaking into critical infrastructure organizations in the energy sector and two other businesses, the financial sector, per a report from Symantec. Uh, this attack started with a Trojanized installer for the X underscore trader trading software from Trading Technologies, which of course was the source of the whole 3CX thing as well. Semantic said the two critical infrastructure organizations are in the United States and Europe and was a, quote, major source of concern. They did not say who those companies were. The report provided by Semantic provided indicators of compromise. So if you're interested in reading this, they do have indicators of compromise and other data, which would help you look for signs of this sort of attack on your own operation. Now, the, I guess the, the famous part of this was the 3CX attack was described as the first known cascading supply chain attack, which basically meant that the compromised X Trader software was downloaded and was then you that that was a supply chain attack, and then that was used to conduct a supply chain attack on 3CX. So uh, an employee of 3CX had downloaded that in the Mandiant reports. Uh, the X Trader app. Uh, then delivered a malware named Veiled Signal, which allowed the attackers to access the employee's device who had installed the XTrader software. And they got their corporate credentials for 3CX. And so by doing that, they were then able to compromise 3CX as well. And they, they're calling that a cascading supply chain attack. Solar winds. Remember solar winds? Big supply chain attack. Speaking of supply chains. Uh, a few years ago, there was a huge supply chain attack on solar winds. It's, it was heavily being used by the U.S. government and other governments as well. But uh, two more high severity vulnerabilities were patched recently in the SolarWinds platform. 
The most severe problem currently is a command injection issue in the infrastructure monitoring and management solution, which is a pretty big part of solar winds. That flaw can be remotely exploited to execute arbitrary commands on your on your, the platform. The attacker does have to have credentials for a valid SolarWinds platform admin account, uh, but you know they can probably get that from some other attack, just like uh, we've seen in the 3CX and so forth. The second one is a local privilege escalation flaw. So I would say these two things together sound pretty bad. This uh, local privilege flaw basically allows a local, a local attacker with a valid system user account to escalate local privileges. Trend Micro Zero Day Initiative, again, was the reporter of both of these, and they said that they have both been patched in version 2023.2. Uh, there was no report of these being exploited in the wild yet, uh, but I would say it's just a matter of time. So you might want to patch up before you're the company we're talking about next in that regard. Well, Mandiant said that one of the most prevalent threat actors in the United States today is teenagers. Yep. Uh, at RSA this week, Mandiant said there are a number of teenage groups that they are actively tracking. Specifically, they said the teens and early 20-somethings who live in the United States and UK who typically speak English as their first language were the culprits. Mandiant went on to say that, quote, the teens are incredibly effective social engineers and they are able to convince people to do things that they ask them to do, like visit certain malicious websites and type in their username and password or get them to log into a desktop computer and install any desk. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, teenagers are often pretty good at convincing, you know, people to sell them beer and things, too. So, you know, it's probably so... So, you know, one of the famous ones was Lapsus Dollar Sign. I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but Lapsus, uh, which hasn't been seen in a while now after a lot of arrests, was led by teenagers. And they went on a crime spree last year, which resulted in a, a bunch of arrests after they targeted NVIDIA, Samsung, Microsoft, Okta, and others and were quite successful. Apparently, another tactic that these groups were using is to call staffers in the organization and spoof the caller ID by pretending to be the help desk. The presenter of this uh, at RSA said that the teen extortionist attacks included new approaches like harassing the company employees and getting their family member data out of the systems and then harassing their family members, including things like sending flowers to the family members. Like uh, there was one that they said they sent flowers to the teenage daughter of one of the company executives and, you know, basically reminding them they should pay their ransoms. Uh, you know, teens behaving badly, say, say it isn't so. I think it was Mark Twain that said that when you turn 12, they put you in a barrel and then they feed you through a straw. And when you turn 16, they take away the straw. I think, I think he was being sarcastic, you know, kind of like, so don't, don't get upset. It was kind of like when Jonathan Swift suggested eating the poor and people got all worked up. Remember that? It was like a little essay he wrote called In a Modest Proposal. Yeah, I, 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 first I was thinking it was Daniel Defoe, but here when I Googled Daniel Defoe cannibal, which I did, I got a lot of pictures of Willem Dafoe, and I love Willem Dafoe, but you know, when your picture comes up in association with Daniel Dafoe and Cannibal, that's, that's kind of scary to me anyway. Well, after the Olympic gold win as a member of the Icelandic Glima team, he tried for a second time, not in Glima this time, but as a rhythmic gymnast. While no gold was found on the mat, he nevertheless found success as a backup dancer for Cher for three tours. Please welcome Jason Wood. Hey, excuse me. Hey, everybody. Good to be with you. Um, so, uh, well, see, I'm just kind of taken aback by my time with Cher. <laughs> Memories. Um, Did you believe in life after life? <laughs> oh, you know, when we think of security... And things we're protecting. Most of the time, we're, we we think of stuff that we are used to interacting with all the time. You know, you got your PCs, servers, routers, web apps, etc. Um, been more focused on operational technology. So think of things like water treatment systems and electrical grids and whatnot. Um, however, pretty much all of us are using satellites at some point without even really realizing it, um, and. I think uh, this is just an area we don't think of very often in security uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, none of us have access to really, or very, very few of us have access to turn around and test satellites and see how security is doing there. Uh, and I think there's an assumption that on most people's part that, hey, if you're going to spend enough money to put something in space, 
this should be fairly well protected. Um, and, you know, how would you go about attacking it anyway? Anyway, Ars uh, Technica reported last Friday on a intelligence document allegedly leaked by a member of the U.S. Uh, Air National Guard that detailed China's efforts to seize control, that's a quote, uh, of enemy satellites at key points of time. According to the article, uh, China is developing these cyber weapons. Again, another quote. I love the idea of a cyber weapon here to hijack satellites that they're interested in. Uh, you know, the makers of Pew Pew Maps are going to have to do some software updates here because now we need pews that are going up out into space uh, to launch their attacks to account for this. The key point here really is, and it's kind of obvious when you think about it, um, most technologically uh, developed militaries depend on satellite communications to conduct their operations. I mean, particularly communication uh, capabilities, you know, the ability to, um, to, to pipe information across the world uh, is, is going to require satellites as well as, you know, location of where the friendly troops are and where the bad guys are and, and things like that. Um, so all of this is depending heavily on the usage of satellites. And then you get the surveillance side of things, you know, data being relayed to, uh, for, for intel purposes. So any modern military is thinking about how do we disrupt, um, an enemy's usage of their satellites and develop their own capabilities to do so. Now, I haven't gone out and looked at any of the documents from the leak, um, but, you know, the way they describe this, it just kind of sounded like a status report uh, by the CIA saying, hey, here's where they're at. Uh, here, here's where, uh, how's China doing on their efforts to dis disrupt satellite transmissions? Uh, according to the Post, China is basically uh, working on targeting a satellite and broadcasting enough traffic at it on the correct frequency or at least close enough to it that it drowns out communications between the satellites, uh, the satellite and its intended control systems. And so this could either lead the attackers to have the ability to inject their own commands into it and tell the satellite to do something that, uh, that nobody wants to have happen, like shut down or fire your, I don't know, fire rockets and move out of orbit, who knows uh, what they would have there, or just at least the ability to disrupt <clears throat> the you know, the, the real-time transmission of data that, that everybody is depending on. And if you do that at the right time, this could really help a military operation be carried out with some more surprise and, and uh, make it difficult for, for everybody to respond. Interestingly to me, <clears throat> the article called out SpaceX's satellites specifically, um, which do fly in a lower orbit, making them a little bit more susceptible, I guess, to you know, being able to be hit with enough strength to to take over. Um, I also wondered, you know, are they more susceptible to this? Because, you know, we have uh, satellites that are primarily geared up for internet access and stuff like that. And, um, you know, probably a little less effort put into to hardening these things. Uh, the article notes that this capability would exceed anything that Russia has put into play in the Ukraine uh, invasion. Now, uh, to some background there, I guess just before Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, last year, a successful attack was conducted against Ukrainian routers that relay uh, information from Viasat satellites, and this degraded uh, Ukrainian uh, military's ability to respond to the invasion significantly. In fact, one uh, person, they were quoted one person as saying this was a catastrophic attack. Now, I would point out that the statement doesn't mean that uh, Russia doesn't have more significant capabilities. It's only what they de deployed uh, in the invasion of Ukraine. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure they're developing their own efforts in there. Amusingly enough, the article notes that the U.S. has never confirmed whether or not we have the same capabilities here, um, which is absolutely no surprise. We're just not going to say anything about it, blah, 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 blah. Nope, I didn't hear that question. Uh, you know what? I, I would say yes. We almost certainly do. Uh, at least I would hope so for all the money we're spending on defense anyway, that somebody would look at this. Uh, all of this got me digging a little bit more because, you know, the article only goes so far. 
So like, well, okay, how long is this? Ha how much of this has happened? Um, what's some additional information about this? And I found an interesting doctoral thesis by James uh, Pover, Pover, uh, titled uh, "Securing New Space on Satellite uh, Cybersecurity." And I actually have, I skimmed through it. It's very large, uh, but it looks like it's really interesting because. Uh, he actually got into doing some stuff where he was able to receive some information that he shouldn't have had. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't want somebody to have access to. Um, in it in this paper, the now doctor Prover uh, devotes twenty pages to briefly, very briefly, summarize incidents that have happened on, where satellites have been attacked in some ways. Uh, the first and most visible uh, first most visible attack uh, that occurred was when Captain Midnight. Uh, who was a disgruntled HBO customer um, and had access to an uplink location, broadcasted his complaints at HBO satellites uh, about the price that HBO was charging satellite dish owners for access to their service. And he kept that going for about four and a half minutes uh, to the eastern United States. So back in 86, you would have seen him complaining about being, him being charged 13 bucks a month for, for access to, to satellite transmissions. He actually got caught uh, primarily because a tourist over him, overheard him talking on a payphone and uh, describing what he had done. And for his efforts, he got pled guilty to federal charges, was fined five thousand dollars, received one year of unsupervised probation, and for one year lost his amateur uh, radio license. So, my have things have changed since then. Um, Doctor Prover goes on to observe information that you know that or you think that he's discovered in his research about satellite transmissions. Uh, and it just really comes down to things we expect to see here in, in more terrestrial bound implementations don't occur up in space. Uh, that uh, basically there's, imp there's really weaknesses in their implementation across the industry. Uh, Pover didn't leave this as theoretical. Uh, he actually spent 400 bucks on equipment and was able to, uh, capture all kinds of information being transmitted through the satellites because there's no encryption going on and get information about major corporations and critical infrastructure providers and stuff like that. Um, the lack of encryption, as he puts it, is because, you know, there's no VPN technology, really, um, because that's not really, at least what we look at for our VPNs is not designed to work with space uh with satellites and the optimizations that take place there, and because perceived performance costs of doing so. So we're back to arguing about whether or not, you know, it's going to tax a CPU too much, which, you know, to be fair, I guess it's running in off solar arrays in space or something like that. But uh, still, he, he's proposing a hybrid solution to make this more possible to lock down some more of this data. So yeah, for 400 bucks, you can apparently point at a satellite and capture all kinds of information. Uh, so, you know, at the end of this quick search, just looking around, um, it, it does appear militaries for one are a little more concerned about keeping their transmission secure because they've got lots of history of things going bad, really bad when you transmit something and the enemy is able to receive it. Um, or when you, you, you aren't able to capture it, uh, if you're, you're on the intercept side. So they have put more effort into encryption of some of this stuff. Uh, regardless of whether or not you think, you know, you take the leaked Pentagon documents as accurate, uh, yes, it's safe to assume that militaries around the world are targeting satellites and are inter interested in what they can do there. This article is just basically another uh, confirmation of that. And, uh, you know, militaries are, are working heavy, hard and, hard and heavy to get their own capabilities built up to have satellite systems to use and to degrade their enemies. As always, you can check the show notes for more information. Cool, I remember back in the 80s, like there was this guy I knew he was receiving, it wasn't anything illegal really, he was receiving like the Tonight Show when they when they beamed it to New York to be like processed so you could actually see the Tonight Show like during the commercials and stuff when they're all just sitting around and talking and things. And he, he was, he had a big satellite dish that was like grabbing that off the feed when it was going to the satellite in New York or something. I don't know exactly how it worked, but it was kind of cool. It was just like, you know, they're all sitting around in between uh, the, the components of it. And it was like the live raw feed of the show. It was pretty weird. 
But yeah, not encrypted or anything. I can get hilarious. Yeah. I remember that. It was in an arcade, and they had this big, huge satellite dish because that was they actually had a party on the night MTV came on. So they like the very first bit of MTV, they had like a party. And because they had that dish, they could pick that stuff up. Interesting. Thanks, Jason. And finally, Twitter continues to be not a dumpster fire, but apparently has moved on into the realm of bur a burning brontosaur with explosive diarrhea that is also being used to cook jackfruit. Yeah. Um, if you don't know what jackfruit is, well, if you ever smell it, you'll know. But anyway, apparently under the new paid subscription service, which will provide a blue check mark for you for only $8 a month, only $8. And if you pay up today, you get a free bottle of Elon Musk. Well, actually it's Musk by Elon. But, but well, all sorts of hijinks have been ensuing then with Stephen King, Elmo, Big Bird, and others getting into Twitter feuds with Elon Musk. But now, apparently, apparent, there's a number of dead people who are now being certified as legit, despite being, well, you know, dead. Uh, Chadwick Bossman, Boss uh, Kobe Bryant, and Anthony Bourdain are all the latest verified celebrities on the Twitter blue train. But unfortunately, they're all deceased. At least a dozen other dead celebrities also have been awarded a blue check mark. The hover over the check mark, of course, says, quote, this account is verified because they're subscribed to Twitter Blue and verified their phone number. So quite interesting. Also available, the new Elon brand Ouija boards and seance kits. So you might want to pick one of those up. But Musk claimed over the weekend that he personally paid for three of the living celebrities, which now have check marks, which included Stephen King. And King then tweeted that Musk should give his blue check mark to charity. Musk had pretty much a bad week. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, Elon really had a tough time this week, which include, you know, included the SpaceX Starship rocket blew up just after launch. Tesla earnings came out last Wednesday, and they weren't great, and that sent the stock price through the floor. So I think that Mark Twain quote uh, that we had earlier might also apply to billionaires, and I know I didn't use the actual quote. I didn't think I'd get through it without uh, laughing. That's how juvenile I am. But that's the news. Thanks, Jason. And I will see you on Friday.